Hello there and welcome to another ClueCon Weekly. I've got the pleasure of recording these on a week by week basis and having some great guests along, interesting people to talk about interesting things. And today I'm delighted to have Sean Dubois uh, join us. Hello, Sean. How are you doing? Good. I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me. Great. It's great to have you along. And uh, I remember meeting you at ComCon in the UK, the event run by Dan Jenkins, and uh, we managed to have a chat over lunch one of the days. And then more recently, uh, we got to meet up again at Cranky Geek in the Google building in San Francisco, and you were presenting there as well. So you're, you're a man that's been around a bit, presenting at all these key kind of open source and RTC kind of events. Yeah, I, I sort of bumbled my way into these events. I like a, a, a ComCon, especially it was amazing. You know, if anyone gets a chance, you have to you have to go. It's just one of those. It's it was just wonderful. You know, we talked about open source for thirty minutes. You can't beat it. A shout out for Dan Jenkins' event there. Great. And um, in both um, ComCon and Cranky Geek, you were talking about an open source project that you've started. But before we get onto that. Um, are we allowed to say what your day job is here? Yeah, yeah, we can say. I, I'm not. I probably can't talk much about it, but um, but yeah, no. I, I work at AWS um, full time, working on WebRTC. I work on uh, Kinesis Video. Great stuff. Okay, so you're an RTC yeah. man mm -hmm. through and through. Okay, well, I wonder if you could uh, introduce us to the open source project that you started, give us its name, and what it was that brought you to the point of starting it as a project, uh, and then. Uh, give us a little bit of a synopsis about what it's there to do, please, Sean. Yeah, so I started uh, Pion, and Pion is this project where the goal is just to build bits and pieces for of technology so people can build RTC projects. So going back, um, I always felt it was too difficult to build something with WebRTC. If you wanted to like spin up and do like a simple data channel thing, or you wanted to spin up a turn server, um, I always felt it like, there was too much barrier of entry to get up and go quickly. And so we started with a turn server in Go that if you've ever done Go, basically it's just one command to go and deploy and build it and run it. And then we moved on and did a WebRTC implementation. And now we're playing with some other things. Um, they're playing with like some uh, display capture and like camera capture straight from Go and stuff like that. So really it's this open-ended project to how can we enable people to build interesting things with RTC that aren't really empowered today. And that's, it sort of just hopefully will go on forever in that vein. And um, I think the most important thing or my biggest goal is to create a community around all of this stuff. So even if the software, every bit of software that I've ever written dies and goes to the wayside and gets deprecated, hopefully like I've created this little RTC community that is building interesting things. So that's. That's the part that excites me most. That we have all these little autonomous little repos with people building things they're passionate about. So it's it's an open ended thing that we just want to pull people in and help them find a community. Great stuff. And yes, by by its very nature, I think open source software kind of uh, almost automatically creates a community around it because of that openness to contributions from people. And of course, it's not necessarily code. You know, it can be testing, it can be debugging, it can be documenting it can be bug marshalling there's you know lots of things yeah. that people can get involved in and um so far sean what has that aspect of the project been like have you managed to kind of lure a few kindred spirits into um contributing yeah so the we have about 70 individual country contributors and i would say like we like it really hovers between like i would say like five and ten people that are actively throwing stuff over the wall but as i've noticed i've only been doing it for two years but stuff really comes in waves. So you'll have like this big wave of excitement. You'll have two, three people that really bounce off each other and then they end up changing jobs or they like move on to something else and they just disappear and then you get another wave. So, um, so yeah, I feel like we're probably on our third wave of high energy, excited contributors. And I'm sure one day they'll just disappear overnight again, um, which is something new to me. I, I'd never, I've always been on the other side where you wander away when you get bored. But, um, but yeah, like we have a fair amount of people. And, and what would you say is it that generates those waves? Is it when you go out and speak about it, or is it a particular need that comes up? Um, I think what it is is it's really you'll have one per, you'll have a lot of people that are probably sitting in the Slack channel and are watching and waiting for someone, 
And then when one person gets brave enough to speak up and contribute and you know like give feedback, then all these other people get pulled in. So I think it's one of those follow the leader things. Um, and I, I, I don't know if that's what it is, but that's what I've that's what I've noticed. It's always there's always like a catalyst. There's one person that's very excited that gets involved, and they're outgoing enough to drag other people in. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I haven't seen it a catalyst anything that I've done to make it happen. Like talking, talking will get a lot of new people trying it out, or a lot of like I'll see like the analytics go up, but no direct response as far as like the the quality of the project. Right, and and and, and just thinking of the the open source nature uh, that you chose to adopt to the project, what was it that made you go in that direction? I'm, I'm guessing that you'd perhaps used other open source projects, but mm. when you were weighing up how to take your ideas forward, um, what was it that uh, pointed you in the direction of making it an open source project? Yeah, so my background has always been in open source. It's the only reason I have a career. So I started out in the late 2000s in um, doing Astro stuff. So that was like way back when, like I was, you know, like hacking up little uh, dial plan scripts, like this was my first job. And then I got a job at Etsy working on PHP. So again, like another like open source ecosystem. So that's that's actually fun. Like my life has been open source by default. Like I know some people, they like went from proprietary to open source. Like I've never worked on any proprietary languages, environments. I've always been open by default. So it it was kind of just a natural progression. It felt like, you know, what should be done. Great, great, okay. And uh, now that you've made that decision, you've got other contributors involved. It sounds like there's a bit of a smorgasbord of uh, different things going on, um, different pieces of functionality. Are you able to share with us maybe kind of three or four of the, the main outputs that have occurred so far? Yeah, so I, um, I think one the part that I think gets people excited is talking about what you can build. So the one that I've seen um, is a lot of robotics and like data channels and IoT stuff. So I have a company a company that was that they have robots in a fulfillment center and they use these data channels to communicate with each other. And if you've ever done WebRTC stuff, you know you can like do the create data channel in the browser and have them talk to each other. But what they do is through just they have all of these robots that are ARM devices and they'll go get and they'll throw a they'll throw a statically linked binary on these robots and have them talk to each other via data channels. And it's pretty cool because of all this mat traversal and all of this hole punching. Mm -hmm. They're able to throw these robots on all these different weird networks and they still can talk to each other. Uh, and it's it's that flexibility of the WebRTC peer connection. So it's really I'm not there's no new interesting technology that I've really written. It's more of how can we make something more accessible? Mm. And so I've seen I've seen that, and then I've seen a lot of um, the the media servers. So a lot of people they um, they want to put SFUs down, and they need that flexibility. Let's say they have to like fit in with an existing billing system, they have to fit in with an ex some like existing piece of software, and so that's where it really comes into play. It's like taking these generic APIs. That's what people want. They don't want like um, to be given a full like suite of software where they tweak knobs. They I'm sort of like dealing with the people that want to build from the ground up. Mm. And um, so I've seen a lot of that. And then the, the one place that's like starting to interest me that I'm hoping takes off more is kind of the computer vision stuff. So like Pion has um, integration with the OpenCV. And so like just with like 50 lines of code, you can like grab your webcam over the internet and then you can wave your hand and it'll print, hey, you're holding up five fingers. And um, I really hope that that takes off because to be able to build your own security systems and fun little stuff like that, like I think it could be super powerful to have, you know, like a low powered camera, you know, sitting in your garage, but then sending mm. off all the data to your hosting provider of choice and then doing all like the heavy crunching out there. Um, so yeah, like it's, it's kind of like a smorgasbord of, hey, here's all these cool things that, that I think are interesting that I want to see people do and just making it, making it accessible. Uh, I think WebRTC has always been kind of like an experts only area where it's mm. it's super hard to get in and build stuff and like it just works and you walk away and you're happy with it. So I'm hoping, I, I feel like in the 90s we had this renaissance where it became super e easy to host your own web page. I'd love to see this generation's renaissance be, hey, it's super easy to build 
decentralized and peer-to-peer -peer applications? Yes, I, I think that um, a number of open source projects have gone through that kind of evolution, if you like. Um, Asterisk, you were mentioning, you did stuff in the Dell plan. Of course, back in the day when people were doing everything on the command line, there was you know, a feeling it needed to be made more accessible to people that didn't, you know, weren't Linux experts and, and didn't uh, know the Dell plan. Uh, and of course, we had different GUIs and things that come out uh, on top of it. And it's the same in the world of free switch as well. And so uh, I think uh, these kind of deeply technical um, uh, open source projects, which are technical by their nature, because even Pion has to be technical by its nature, even though what it's striving to do is to make these things more accessible. That means that you guys do have to get down in to the deep stuff, doesn't it, in order to simplify mm -hmm. it for other people to use. Um, yeah. has, has anybody come along wanting to do anything that you thought is really kind of outside the scope of what you set out to achieve? Honestly, the, the data channels, what's outside. So I can this for left and like, and that's what I understood. Um, what was like really um, outside. I'll just stop you for a minute. Sorry, okay. that last little bit was a little bit interrupted by, I don't know whether it was a lack of connectivity, but can you start that sentence again, please? Because I, yeah. I think you missed it. Um, so like my background was always the RTP. So when I started Pion, that's really all I knew and all I had done. But what excited me or was totally out was all this data channel stuff. Um, the first one I saw was that Tor, they have a, they have this project that does censorship circumvention via data channels. So you, let's say you have open access to the web, someone will connect to you via data channel over UDP direct connectivity and request a web page through you. And that kind of blew my mind for the first time to say, oh, like this is the potential, like to have like a binary transport to do whatever we want over, that's super powerful. And that's like opens up a bunch of interesting possibilities. So that was the kind of eureka or magic moment for me with WebRTC is realizing there's way more than just the, the audio and video use cases. Like what really is, is having just binary data between two people and the flexibility that comes with that. So that was a big one. Um, the robotics was a big one. And then. That is one of the, the great things about open source projects is people come along and they kind of stretch it in mm -hmm. the direction that they need to stretch it for their, you know, what they're doing. But of course, everybody else benefits because mm -hmm. they're you know, contributing to the common good. And uh, yeah, it's one of, one of the lovely things around it. Yeah, for, and that's what really, what motivates me is the kind of joy from getting those experiences, like being around people building interesting things like that. Like I have, there's no, I, I don't have a plan to ever make money or ever like, you know, turn this into like paid software. Like I, I, I think what's best for the people using it is for it to stay as it is, where it's completely unencumbered and, and stuff like that. So it's not, it's not great for me long-term career-wise to keep putting effort in it. But like what motivates me is it, it really just makes me happy to come and see people doing stuff like that. Um, mm it's just well, like a light yeah and although it doesn't have maybe a direct link to um your financial income of course it can't hurt to be on the cv when you yeah. your next position that you know you you created and maintain an open source project that's doing people some good yeah no that it definitely doesn't hurt and it's opened a lot of doors and like interesting people i've um talked to but at the end of the day i think people would be a lot better served at least in in my bubble by doing you know by spending more time, you know, interviewing and doing leak code and and like being better at being better at being an employee, like it's a it translates to a lot of like intangible skills that I appreciate. Um, but honestly, like making it through like the normal HR and getting hired and talking to people bar, like Pion does not help at all. <laughs> like like I, I have companies that use it, and I like email HR and I've applied and I just got like auto rejected. So it's it doesn't like it opens up some doors, but the reality is like. You can't circumvent all the all the systems we have. Right, right. I'm, I'm, you've reminded me actually. Yeah, as you know, um, back at ComCon, I did a keynote speech about open source projects and the people that run them. And one of the reasons why somebody said that they'd started it was to kind of do proof of concept and, and make progress in something they were interested in. Um, uh, and I remember the distinct phrase. Um, without doing a load of tedious internships as well. Yeah. As well. <laughs> Yeah, uh, allowed them to kind of pursue their goal. So uh, that's a that's a good thing. Now you mentioned the um, the association with Tor. 
and the, the kind of usefulness you'd been able to bring there. And I remember that was part, I believe, of the presentation that you did at Cranky Geek. Is there any other um, places that you'd like to talk about where you feel that um, um, Pion has, a, a, you know, achieved noteworthy things? Yeah, so the, the other two that I'm proud of that I'm trying to make happen is the first is the internet protocol file system. Um, Pion's used there, and I thought that was super interesting, and I was, I was excited because um, we got a bunch of feedback and like, hey, this needs to be better. And so that, that helped the project grow a lot. And then the one I'm working on right now is uh, the web torrent. So to be able to, you can um, download like a torrent by just visiting a web page and all of the, the signaling handles like connecting to the torrent tracker and then all the data channels is how the data is exchanged. And right now there's no really lightweight torrent, bit web torrent client for that I can run on a server. And so we're trying to do one and go um, and it's really just a lack of bandwidth to get it done. So if one of your listeners is interested, we'd love to have them come help out. Uh, but those are yeah, those yeah. are the. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, when we get to the um, end of our time together, I'll ask you to go through how people can join in mm -hmm. and and uh, contribute. Um, but th thanks for sharing those um, achievements with us. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you as somebody that started and is leading an open source project is what is your favorite thing about that role, about um, you know being at the center of an open source project as you are? Um, the, thing that, the thing that has like brought me the most happiness was I've, I've had a couple people who have joined the Pion community and found jobs out of it. Um, that was kind of like, for me, like that's like the perfect moment because I got into this industry like I, I went to um, high school and then I got a job immediately after. So a lot of people took risks on me and helped mm -hmm. me get a job. So I was excited to see that um, it felt like we're kind of paying that back to have people That's get employed. And, and is that because there are employers out there who want to hire people that have got pie on skills? Or is it just through a sort of association that they've been involved and in the right opportunity has popped up somewhere? So yeah, the the Pion skills like they had they I don't know like I don't know if those companies will long term go with Pion, but at this time they're using Pion and mm. um, they want people that are playing with it and working on it. And I think it's just the general deep WebRTC knowledge that you learn by contributing to Pion will will serve you. That's amazing. That's great. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you about the flip side, uh, Sean. Um, what's your least favorite thing? <laughs> you know, a bit, been in the in the heat of this open source battle. Um, I think the one that that makes me that is the most stressful is probably the way that people evaluate open source software as as a product. And so people will drop in on the channel and ask, "Can you do this, this, and this?" And if you don't do it that day, they leave. And I get like I get why they're doing it because you want to go and evaluate, you know, something. You're you're trying to make the best decision for your business. Hmm. But as an open source project, it's it's tough because that's not. It's not how things work. Like if you want something, you can stay and and explain and like put it on the roadmap and stuff like that. Um, I don't like I don't blame people for doing it, and I think I've done it a lot in the past. Being on the flip side, I now see the frustration beyond that. Like these are projects that like grow directly from user input. Like these things don't exist because right. not because I don't want to do them, just because I don't know what you need. So um, I think people, the last, yeah, people popping in with that kind of short term requirements and not giving the space in time mm -hmm. to uh, you know adjust and adapt and, and come up with the new stuff yeah because um, I would and I would love to adjust adjust and adapt like that's but yeah we just don't we just don't get the time yes and and, and sadly those same sort of people are perhaps not the ones that are going to contribute yeah. to the adjusting and adapting they're mm -hmm. going to want somebody else to do it and then they're just going to take it um, yeah yes so no, I wish. Wait, 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 wait. That, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, so I wish that those people would join and stick around and contribute and and stickiness. But like, yeah, it's. But yeah, the reality is like, even if they got what they wanted, then they just leave. Yes, yes, that that is a sadness, but I think it's just part of the deal when you're you know in the heart of open source. Really, that's part of the uh, the way things work out sometimes. Okay, um, so uh, b before we come on to how people contribute. Let's see if I can summarize and, and please sort of fill in the gaps here. But from what I understand, you created Pion to allow people to do things in the area of WebRTC in easier and faster ways rather than getting bogged down 
in the sort of incumbent technology, you've tried to kind of abstract away from that a little bit. Um, would you like to give any more detail around that? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's it. Like if you're if you're a WebRTC developer that wants something that is quick, like it's the nice thing with Go is I write it once and it works across all the languages. It's a Go is a language that's modern that has all this wonderful tooling. So um, it's it's nice that you can bring developers onto it that aren't that don't have deep C and C plus plus knowledge. You can it's like a I'm trying yeah exactly just be the RTC for everybody. Great, great stuff. Okay, and um, as we round off, Sean, we're really grateful that you dropped by to talk about Pion. Mm -hmm. Can you tell um, tell people how they can get involved, what what kind of involvement you're looking for, and uh, where they can go and find the resources that you have at the moment? Yeah. So um, I think the best first place to jump if you go to pion.ly slash Slack, um, we have a Slack channel with I think around like 400 people in it. And I'd love for you to just come in and join and talk to us and tell us what you need. Um, and, um, could you uh, go ahead and spell out Pion for those people that yeah. have never come across it, please? Yeah. Uh, P I O N dot L Y. Pion dot L Y. Great. Okay. So that's where people can come in and start talking and getting a feel for what's going on. Is there any specific types of contributions? And, or contributors that you're looking for at the moment? Um, I, I think that look, right now the biggest hurdle we have is we have um, around like 50 issues in our GitHub issue tracker. And if you go in and you see one that you find interesting, um, you should grab it. But honestly, I think you should use the project, figure out what bothers you, and then go fix it. Like you'll be the most motivated by like fixing your own problems. So hopefully mm. you can come in and find what frustrates you the most. And honestly, like I encourage people that. Like everything's on the table. If you want to rewrite something, if you want to like optimize something, if you believe something like that we need API breakage, like I want to encourage people that this is something that like that that their ownership is like that I want them to feel like they own it. I don't want it to be like this kind of thing where it's never changing. Like I know there's a lot of open source projects that you get resistance. So I just I encourage you to come and like it's a great way to learn and be involved. Great stuff. Well, thank you very, very much, Sean, for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, it was great meeting you at ComCon and at Cranky Geek, and I'm hopeful that we will get to meet again at some other place yeah. uh, in the in the coming um, coming years and uh, and maybe even months. I know we've got Open Source World going on down in Florida. Um, that's on the where are we talking? That's uh, February twelfth and fourteenth down there. The general open source one. And then, sounds like there's some dog going on. Yeah. Just there. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully that's. Oh my gosh. Here, hold on. Sorry. We've got a, a new member to our sh to our show, uh, Daisy here, yeah. <laughs> who can't find it in herself to behave for thirty minutes. I'm having a little bit of cuteness, it, it, as yeah. if, the, if you and I weren't that cute. Yeah. <laughs> in there. Uh, great. Okay. Thanks, uh, Sean. And also, um, ComCon. We'd love to, uh, not ComCon, ClueCon, I should say. ClueCon's coming up in August of uh, next year in Chicago. And uh, that's uh, another uh, place where we love to get hold of open source people to talk about things. So uh, I'm hopeful we can see you uh, and hear more from you at one of these events in the near future, Sean. Oh, no, I would absolutely love it. Great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. And uh, perhaps you can come, come back to ClueCon Weekly at some stage in the future and let us know what's been going on. Okay. All the best to you, Sean. We'll say goodbye for now.